Welcome to Construct Tech TV. You asked, and today I will answer. On today's special tech update, I'm going to address five common questions among our viewers. These include, what is generative design in BIM? What are swarms of autonomous robots? Will ductless disrupt residential home building? How will drone delivery centers impact construction? And will cigarette butts really help pave our roads? Now, these are all great discussions. But first up, what is generative design in BIM? At its core, it's nature's evolutionary approach to design. Now, studies have been done on generative design for years, and we all know this. Researchers have looked at integration of generative design and algorithms in the early existing BIM platforms. And this can actually bridge the gap from conceptual design to actually detailed design. Roughly two years ago, Autodesk took interest and started investing research related to generative design. This was mostly on the manufacturing side, but Autodesk and many other companies also began to explore how it could be used in the construction industry. So basically, designers input goals into the generative design software. This also includes parameters such as materials. Then the software explores all the possibilities and generates the design alternatives. So this enables contractors to test and learn and see what works and actually what doesn't. Could this actually help us bridge that gap in the future? Only time will tell, but it's certainly worth keeping in mind. What are swarms of autonomous robots? It's the coordination of a multi-robot systems. Think of it like when an individual machine can autonomously decide what it wants to do or coordinate with its neighbors. The Weiss Institute at Harvard University is doing some really awesome research in this area specifically for the construction industry. The robots act independently, but they work collectively, and they can carry bricks and build staircases. Then they can actually climb on them to actually add bricks to a structure. The Kilobot technology demonstrates collective swarm algorithms in hardware rather than merely computer simulations. This hive operating system could perform complex tasks in natural environments. This can actually be used to build 3D structures. Now the question I have for you, Will a swarm of robots descend on your job site? I know they're coming very soon. We all know that a typical U.S. home has a traditional duct system. But will ductless disrupt residential home building? Ductless air conditioning first emerged back in the 1980s. Still, it has a small share of the residential market today. But that is all about to change. The residential market is expected to grow about 8.5 percent between 2016 and 2021. Driving factors include low energy consumption and, in fact, easy installation. Ductless enables zone control of a home, as most of you know, and it offers increased comfort, greater energy efficiency, and superior air quality. Still, many of you trades haven't adopted this yet. With new advances, some of the systems even have sensors that enable the homeowners to adjust room temperatures automatically. So if you are trying to determine if this is the right kind of option for the next building project that you have, ask yourself the following questions. Are you building net zero energy homes? Does your buyers want custom zone control? If so, ductless might be something for you to consider. How will drone delivery centers impact construction? This summer, Amazon painted a pretty picture of the future of drone delivery. Its objective was to get drones near large populations to be more efficient than regular road delivery. Hello, drone beehives. These beehives just might alter the construction world in two key ways. The first is construction companies will need to build these beehives like buildings. There will be new technical requirements for creating this new type of structure. But even more than that, I envision another trend emerging. As I see it, they will create new opportunities for you at the job site. Now picture it. Drone centers might offer a hub for all of your devices. At the beginning of the day, they automatically fly over your job site, collecting all the data that's happening at the job site. 
This data is then sent to the project teams that are there to make critical business decisions about what's happening on your project. And then at the end of the day, the drones settle back into their hives where they give themselves a great big buzz for another day's work. Now that's something to think about. Our final question of the day is, will cigarette butts help pave our roads? RMIT University in Australia says yes, and I for one hope they are right. A team of researchers has found that asphalt mixed with cigarette butts can handle heavy traffic and also reduce thermal connectivity. The cigarette is encapsulated in vitamin and paraffin wax to lock in the chemicals. This also prevents any leaching from the asphalt concrete. What a great way to solve the challenge of the cigarette butt pollution. About six trillion cigarettes are produced every year. This results actually in about 1.2 million tons of waste, of which I guesstimate most of those butts end up on our roads. Sadly, these waste figures are estimated to increase by more than 50% by 2025. Now, if we all think long enough, what other ways can we use to help pave our roads? Now that's your tech update for today. Hello, we are on the road today at Interdrone, and I am here with my good friend George Matthews from Kespri. Hello, George, welcome. Hi, Peggy, thank you for having me on again. So, George, as the CEO of Kespri, so many things have now been happening. You have just been doing all kinds of things. You've met the president. You guys have lots of changes going on. You're like so popular, You're like the king of the drone world now. It's been a busy few months for sure, Peggy. We've been really busy and really helping our customers continue to scale their industrial operations. The last time I was on air with you, we talked quite a bit about the relationship that we had been building up with John Deere for them to effectively resell Casper drones and introduce the capability of drones providing better earthworks projects for construction use cases. Well, since that moment on, we've actually done a lot of work to expand into the insurance sector, and in particular when it comes to claims management for wind damage, hail damage related activities, we've actually fully automated and built a complete solution that enables the claims adjusters themselves to be able to do similar work to what we did in the construction space where they're more effective in terms of processing that claim than ever before. And think about what's happened right now. We talk about hurricanes and things that happen. There's been a lot going on, what's happened now in Texas. Talk a little bit about that, how that's important. Yeah, well, first and foremost, our hearts go out to all of the impacted folks, particularly down in the greater Corpus Christi area, as well as Houston. The level and extent of the tragedy, particularly around Harvey, is just uncalculable in terms of just the damage as well as the rescue and recovery efforts that have been underway. So what has happened in the last 48 hours is that we've largely switched over to a recovery effort and the temporary flight restrictions that were in place for drones were lifted. So Kespri drones are now flying within the area to really help on the recovery. That's amazing. Yeah, no, it is. And specifically around the claims processing that's needed to just get claims adjudicated on wind and other weather related damage that's of course occurred in the region. And now we're hearing that even more damage in other areas now. We're looking at Florida and other places that are worried about more, you know, damage and bad weather and things that are happening. Yeah, we're, we're tracking the situation with Irma very closely. It looks like both coasts of Florida will likely be impacted in the next 48 to 72 hours. And so, yeah, we have a situation right now where two superstorms have hit different parts of the country within a very, very short period of time. And who would have thought drones could come into such use in such dramatic ways? Yeah, well, I think this is where you and I have discussed this before. If we think about the drone as the new sensor network, it has all of the necessary collection factors that are available to get information very decisively in the hands of people that need to make better decisions. In the case of Caspery, we happen to take our own industrial drone and then automate the analytics, the insights that come 
out of it for claims processing in the case of insurance, for construction work and earthworks projects, or in the case of the mining aggregate space for volumetric stockpile assessment and inventory management. If we look at those opportunities, it's really about just enabling that worker on the ground to just be more productive with a drone assisting their work. Talk about it in a safety perspective, because when I think about this, this brings safety and information in a whole different perspective. I think when we talk about industrial work, there is very dangerous work that happens all the time. If you think about the adjusters that might have to climb a roof, it's actually the third most occupationally hazardous work in North America. Like People fall off roofs all the time when they're actually assessing damage, they're looking at the extent of what a rebuild project looks like. And so to introduce a drone that can safely fly overhead and get the volumetric measurements to get the hail assessment, that the damage assessment automated in the same manner in the construction mining space to be able to not have to climb a stockpile because people fall off of stockpiles all the time. Or in the construction space. We hate to think that, right? right? To get the volumetrics right to do the accuracy of what a topology looks like so that buildings don't lean and fall. It's all about having a level of safety that's unprecedented with the leverage of a drone really assisting that human potential. Where are you guys going next? Because we're talking about what the, the tragedies we're dealing with now, but the positive things that drones are being, bringing to that, this kind of effort. Where do we see drones going next for the construction industry? Because I really see drones doing so much more in now the rebuilding factor of all the things we have to do. Right, so when you think about that rebuilding factor, really to help understand how things change over time. We are introducing additional capability into our Earthworks construction kit, which is going to be released into the market in the next few months. So just to have better cut fill maps, to be able to have capability for base plane visualizations, to be able to accommodate for what change occurs over time, particularly on a rebuilding project where before and after certain events to understand what the change in that topology is. So to be able to do that in a very natural, effective way, you have to have that user experience really be well accommodated with applications that support users for those use cases. And that's really where Casper has been focused from its origination and inception in 2013, and certainly how we're continuing to advance this space, particularly from a data analytics standpoint as we push forward. I want to thank George Matthew, the CEO of Kespri, for joining us on our On the Road at Innerdrone for our special edition of Safety Zone. Stanford Hospital was originally constructed in 1959, but now the new Stanford Hospital is getting an upgrade. Ground broke on May 1st, 2013. It has 368 beds, 28 procedure rooms, and 22 elevators. But I want to touch on some amazing new technology innovation here. This hospital is being built in California. So what does that mean? It needs to hold up in earthquakes. To address this, there are 206 seismic isolators in each that is capable of supporting 2 million tons. This facility also accommodates the latest in medical technology. But I'm going to let an expert tell you all about it. I recently had the opportunity to chat with Bert Hurlbut. He is the Vice President of New Hospital Construction at Stanford Healthcare. So let's take a look at what Bert had to tell me all about. I'm here with Bert Hurlbut, who's the Vice President of New Stanford Hospital Construction. Bert, well, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. So, Good. Bert, now we've talked today about all the amazing things that are going on here, and we've toured this hospital. It's amazing. You have to be pretty excited about what you've accomplished so far. It's, it's an amazing five years that I've been here. Well, actually six years, but five years of construction. Uh, we started back in 13. We've done probably... 52 months of construction now probably got another year of hard construction then it's all the commissioning checkout uh, activation and then get the patients in the rooms so we're almost to the end of this journey what what has been the most exciting part of this project for you oh uh, the best part is just getting it built that i tell people when i go to meetings i get the best job at stanford i get to build this this big hospital a uh, little bit about the hospital 368 beds all single patient rooms, uh, 
uh, we've got about 820,000 square feet of facility. There's one floor below grade, seven above grade. We have a helipad on top. We have a level one trauma center. It's the only one between San Francisco and San Jose. So if you're injured or have a heart attack or whatever, anywhere mid-peninsula, you're going to come to Stanford Hospital. Uh, people ask me, you know, are you going to get hospital awards or architectural awards for hospitals? And I say, no, we won't. We're going to get architectural awards. This building is so beautiful that it's going to, it rivals just, just any other beautiful building out there, be it museums or libraries or hotels or whatever. This is one beautiful facility. But let's talk about something I found really interesting. The seismic shift ideas that you have on this building. That to me is interesting for someone like me who lives in Chicago, who doesn't think about the things that you have to think about living here in California. Talk about that because I think people want to find that or will find that interesting from both a building perspective and somebody who might have to come to this hospital. You like that part, that our building moves. It moves. We can move six feet in an earthquake from center, three feet one way, three feet the other way. We have these things called base isolators. They're made by a company called EPS, Earthquake Protection Systems, and they're called a triple friction pendulum system. And they're all steel with uh, kind of a Teflon coating on each of the parts that slide over each other. And the gentleman that invented them is Victor Zayas, and we asked him, what is that material? And he just says, it's Victor's secret sauce. So he won't tell us. Uh, to give you a story about it, before the building started, I had surveyors come out and find the four corners of the facility. So at each corner, I had a easel set up and some renderings of what you would actually see if you went to that corner of the building. And I toured executives through and at each location, I'd say, okay, if you're standing here on entry or you're going to see the ambulance entrance or the emergency entry or you'll see the garden entry, whatever it's going to be. And now I give them a story about construction itself. Uh, a quick one, I said, we got to take 180,000 cubic yards of earth out of the hole to get ready for the facility. And everybody just shrugs their shoulders. I says, well, you probably don't know what that means, but I'll tell you what it means, that we're going to be digging dirt for over six months and it's going to be truck coming in, truck going out. And on our best day, we had 450 loads, and there's only 480 work minutes in a work day. It's one truck leaving the site about every 75 seconds, which means one truck comes back every 75 seconds. So when you stood on the corner right out front, something went this way or this way every 35 seconds or so. It's a lot of movement of pieces and parts, just getting the dirt out. So at one of the locations, I said, our building's going to be base isolated, and it's going to move six feet in an earthquake. So somebody says, oh, wow, what's that going to feel like? And I went, I don't know. I said, that's a good question. And I thought a minute, I went, it won't feel like anything. The building actually doesn't move, and the building stays still in space, and it's the earth that's moving back and forth during the earthquake underneath the building. So the building actually sits stationary. So if you were in the building looking out, you'd see everything moving back and forth. You'd see cars rocking back and forth, but the building itself will not actually move, although it looks like it's moving six feet in an earthquake. So now you've got this amazing hospital, but now let's talk about the most important thing besides building a beautiful hospital, one that's not going to move when it needs to or shifts when it's supposed to because it's safe. But what about the most important thing, coordinated care? You've got this model for coordinated care so patients have the best advanced technology. That's what you put in this as well because you built all these things in the walls, the best technology there for doctors. Talk about that. The health care that's delivered here at Stanford is some of the best in the world. Just recently, U.S. News & World Report gave Stanford number nine on the honor roll. And that's pretty darn good, considering that Stanford is just not one of the mega hospitals like Mass General or Johns Hopkins. I've been to some of those other hospitals. Those are thousands of beds. Right now, this facility is only 475 beds. We'll move up to about 600 beds. However, the School of Medicine are the folks that actually deliver the care. They're the physicians that go into the patient rooms. And since I've been here for six years, only, six, only been here six years, they've had three Nobel Prize winners named from Stanford University. And they've all been in medicine, which is pretty amazing. So they're 
coming up with things today that we will see probably in community hospitals in 25 years from now, which will be routine, such as MRIs right now. Everyone has an MRI when you hurt your knee or hurt your shoulder, whatever. But, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that was just obscure. Nobody knew what an MRI was. But now that's one of the things that will filter down to uh, the general public. Uh, a thing they're doing right now is genetic profiling. They're running your genome. You can run your genome now for maybe $5,000. In the genome, there's some markers, and it will tell you if you've got a propensity for uh, muscular dystrophy or uh, some uh, dementia or just something in the future, and they'll tell you, you know, you've got to watch out for this. This is what we can do to prevent it or just watch out. Where do you see the future of construction healthcare? Where do you see it all going? The future, that's a very good question. That my crystal ball is a little bit cloudy right now, but with this, uh, the Medicare and the Obamacare, we're seeing a lot of it becoming outpatient, as you've seen in, back in Chicago, here, everywhere. It's a lot of outpatient. However, people are going to get sicker than they can just handle in outpatient settings. And this, this place is one of the few across America, right now in the top 10, that if you're really, really sick, you've got to come to a place like this or Johns Hopkins, uh, Cleveland Clinic, UCLA, UCSF, or one of those. And this is one of the models for one of those type facilities. Going forward, if you had to say one ending thought, what would you want everyone to know about what Stanford Healthcare is all about now, the new hospital? We're building a beautiful facility, but it's what's going to be done inside that facility, that it's the caregivers that are working tirelessly to make sure that the patient's experience when he's here is just the best they could ever imagine. Uh, years ago, I don't think it was that way at Stanford, that the doctors just thought that they were ruled the roost and just thought they were the best and what they said had to go. And it's not that way now. Stanford is a very patient-friendly place. It's a wonderful place. If you've got to get treated, this is the place to go, bar none. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much. All right. Some pretty cool stuff, right? Well, that's not all. Chad Reeder with New Stanford Hospital and Greg Schoonover with the Clark McCarthy team also took us on this amazing hospital tour. So join me next week as I journey from the Hellestop to the operating room. I will take you inside this amazing new Stanford Hospital. But for this week, that's someone you should know, or maybe I should say, that's something you should know. Will sensors become the next innovation at the job site? A new innovation center is dedicated to fostering the creation, development, production, and even promotion of cutting edge sensor technologies. By working collaboratively and creating a connected community, Sensor City hopes to be a hub for sensor technology. Here to chat with me all about this trend is Allison Mitchell, Executive Director of Sensor City. So, Allison, let's talk about Sensor City and why you set this up in Liverpool and what you guys are doing today. Well, um, why we set it up in Liverpool? Because Liverpool is right in the centre of the United Kingdom. Um, it's a fantastic location with a really vibrant business community. Um, we have a huge number of companies that are coming up, particularly in sensors and Internet of Things related activities. And what we've created here is a purpose-built building for those companies to come into, to take off this space or to be a member of, and we've got the most fantastic facilities for them here. So what exactly is it designed to do, and why is it important when we think about construction companies and what we're focused on, or what you're focused on, I should say? Um, well, for, from construction companies, Internet of Things and sensors are really important. Um, sensors are right the way across pretty much every sector in our lives at the moment. So whether it's food technology, whether it's construction, whether it's automobiles, um, health, sensors are everywhere. And in construction in particular, um, everybody will be familiar with the way that sensors are being used in buildings management, making sure that we've got more effective and more efficient buildings and that we are monitoring how people are using those buildings. 
Um, so that's one way that it's used with, within the construction industry in particular. When you think about that today, you know, in buildings and how sensors are changing the way we think about things, I mean, we are just beginning to see the construction industry embrace the Internet of Things. And now thinking about it in buildings, that's really changing dramatically. How are we getting construction companies and buildings really looking at the Internet of Things? Because it's exciting and it's changing pretty quickly. It certainly is. It's really changing rapidly. And I think I think it's quite exciting across each of these sectors. We've got um, a mix of very large companies who can't move quickly um, to exploit these technologies. But what we've got is lots of small companies that are coming up. And those small companies with new ideas who can move quickly are the ones that we're incubating in this building here. So they're companies who are working right at the cutting edge of technology and can then help the larger companies to take on those those technologies. So the large companies might buy those, smaller companies might choose to invest in them or to license that technology. And what we're doing in Centre City is housing those small, really rapidly growing companies and making them available to some of the larger and medium sized companies. Talk about that, those innovative startups, those tech startups who, who have these creative ideas, because that's where I think that incubator brain kind of knowledge comes out of there that you talk about that get purchased, you know, because I think that's where the new ideas come from. And that's where the tech companies see that. And then the construction companies who are always kind of hesitant start seeing that this can really be used in their companies. Yeah, certainly. I mean, at this very moment, actually, we're running a hack event upstairs on our third floor. Um, and that's about health, but actually it's not just about health, it's about how people can stay in their homes and be looked after in their homes. So we've got a whole range of technologies coming out from some of the companies that are in the building here, but from some of the companies also around the Liverpool and Northwest region, working with, for example, in this instance, with the health authorities um, to actually look at solutions to enable people to be in their, in their homes, in their own building for longer rather than having to go into hospital and also how we treat them when they maybe they've been in hospital and they come out. So these, we're actually running a hack today with, with Amazon involved as well and with the local city council to look at how they can enable people to stay in their homes. So typical sort of things there um, can be testing, um, making sure we're monitoring whether people are still in the beds or whether they've fallen onto the floor, which can cause problems, making sure they're getting help quickly, making sure they're not getting dehydrated, which causes a lot of falls. Um, making sure there's some of the simple things like, uh, you know, which are already available, such as turning on your kettle in the morning means that somebody's still up and well. But it can move to quite sophisticated um, monitoring of people, of people as well. So that's actually um, going on today. We're going to get some new companies created out of that, and then they will be working with the health authority. So we could equally be doing an event on construction with a number of companies coming from different parts of sectors, not just from traditional construction companies, where we were working at how do you ensure that a building is being used efficiently and where your spaces are that maybe aren't being used. Um, so do you want to track people as they're using those buildings? Do you want to see how they're using the space? Do you want to know what humidity levels are appropriate for them? Do you want to be able to open vents at a particular time that's particular to that building? A um, whole range of things that could be coming through um, where companies, the smaller companies, the exciting ideas are bubbling up from that. And what we're doing is looking at sensors across industry. Um, so we'll find that somebody in healthcare has got an idea which actually might be great for construction. Um, so dehydration of people I just mentioned could actually apply also in, in lots of other situations. So in a hospital, for example, are those patients being looked after in, in a well, in, in a truly, in a really well way? Um, and there's some, some, just all these small companies have got fantastic ideas and that's what we're incubating here. I think that's what you just described. Sensors right now are going to change the way construction sees things and these incubator ideas that you're doing, these hacks that you're describing, is we haven't even begun to think about how sensors are going to change the way construction is going to use it in homes, in buildings, and this new ideas that are going to come out in these startups are going to be using sensors in whole new creative ways is what you're describing. Definitely, definitely. And it, yes, I mean, it's just so exciting. Um, I'll try and think of some examples. I mean, we've got companies here that are working on people who um, 
you know, we're putting we're putting sensors into suits for people so that we can see what temperature they are. We can measure their oxygen levels. And that might be someone who's an elite athlete, but it could just be someone who's visiting a building and seeing if they're comfortable. If they're in a hospital environment, for example, it could be checking um, their fluids and their uh, their temperature and their which which way up they're lying, except whether they're comfortable or not. Um, but equally, that could apply to me sitting in this building now. Am I am I sitting correctly? Am I uh, the right temperature? So, what what can work in extreme environments, I think, will just become the norm in our office buildings and in our homes. Well, Alison, I really enjoyed spending time with you. Thank you for spending time with us here on Innovation in Tech. Alison Mitchell from Sensor City. Thank you so much today. Thank you very much, Peggy. Should you rent or should you buy? This is an age-old question that contractors have faced for many years. This question can extend to every single device, tool, or piece of equipment on your construction job site or within your company. And this can include drones, tablets, bulldozers, robots, cranes, you name it, and the list goes on. I think the answer is unique for each and every firm. But before making that rent versus own decision, you might want to consider three key points that I've come up with for you today. Number one, determine your needs. That's very important. What is the length of the project? The type of a job will determine how long you need a certain piece of equipment. If it's a long-term project, you might consider purchasing it for sure. But do you need someone else to handle the maintenance, let's say service, repairs, even insurance? Should you consider renting and outsourcing all of those tasks? That's something you want to take under consideration. Will it be more cost effective in the long run? Either way, the first step is to determine your needs. Next on my list, and number two, you might want to do a cost analysis. So this is perhaps one of the most important steps alongside of that needs assessment we just talked about. The industry has experienced a rise in the cost of tools and equipment on the job site. And this is often the result of technology that is being embedded in just about everything imaginable that we talk about on the show. And there are a number of great advantages to all this embedded technology. But as also with that, there's a cost as well. So we're also seeing new emerging technologies such as drones and bricklaying machines and even exoskeletons, as we talk about, coming to the job site. Candidly, many of these have hefty price tags, but the good news is, is that many of the makers of these solutions are offering you the option to rent instead of buy. But this can give contractors exposure to new technology on a new piece of equipment and the ability to determine an ROI for them. The, this trend just might drive the rental market in the future, especially with telematics and excavators and other equipment. So let me give you my third piece and final piece of advice here is to consult an expert. Because technology is rapidly becoming obsolete, there are many things I want you to consider. With the lease, now think about this, you might pass the financial burden of this obsolescence that I mentioned on to the leasing company because you pay nothing up front. On the other hand, while you might help with the cash flow, ultimately you pay more over the length of the lease instead of purchasing. What works best for your company requires careful consideration. And this is where an expert comes in. Or talking with someone who has rented the equipment previously might have a good idea. Here you can get real world experience from someone who knows how renting works for them or what they've learned. With renting, at the very least, you can test the system out for yourself before you decide to go all the way and buy it. Also, I suggest reading case studies. Take advantage of the rent versus buy calculators. That's another idea. There are also many resources out there that can help you make this decision. Today, there's a great uptick in the rental market. This is also because of, as I mentioned, all of this emerging technology. So making the choice to rent versus buy requires careful consideration based on your specific needs. But you need to think about it and do a lot of research. So that's your Learn It for today. This 
This week's word of the day is lean. Lean is a method of construction that minimizes waste, time, and effort in order to provide maximum value. It has its roots in manufacturing, but is widely regarded in construction today. This starts with a contractual agreement. Oftentimes on lean construction projects, every stakeholder on the project is involved in the overall design and flow of the entire construction process. Architects, engineers, GCs, subs, and even suppliers are all brought into the mix to provide their own special expertise. This entails a level of trust and even understanding that recognizes what the client wants, but even more importantly, why they need it. Each stakeholder makes clear definitions. So this includes the necessary labor, equipment, materials, and information needed for each activity. Each particular step must directly add value to the customer or it is eliminated. To do this, con contractors keep in mind downtime. So this includes defects, overproduction, waiting, not using talent, transport, inventory, motion, and excess processing. These areas are examined long before work begins. Contractors may actually work backwards from a set of completion dates. This includes coordinating schedules of when work can be handed off from one team to the very next. Planning ensures a gradual flow of work processes that is reliable and even flexible. Stages of production are performed in sequences and often sectioned off with some ahead of schedule, while others might even be running behind. Each project is different, and each collaboration requires a different lean approach. Processes like BIM and integrated project delivery help make lean effective for contractors. The key to lean is all about trimming the fat on your construction processes. In the end, it leaves you in good shape for more projects to come, and lean, that's your word of the day. And thanks for watching Construct Tech TV, where we are talking tech at the job site.